My job now is basically to say thank you all for being here, all of you who are uh, both uh, presenters and partic otherwise participants. Um, just 
uh, we've had a, a few changes in the program, so it's a little different than we had anticipated, but we're going to start with um, a panel of uh, discussants and approximately five minutes each making presentations about the work that they're doing or about what they see. We're going to, uh, the participants or the panelists that we've got right now are uh, Steve Miller and Jesu Estrada. Uh, we're expecting to have commentary from other people as well. We have so many knowledgeable people here. Um, I'll mention just a few. We have uh, Howard Ehrman, uh, <clears throat> who's been active in public health in Chicago for many years. Uh, we have um, uh, Kathy Powers, who is a, he's been active in the People Response Network around COVID for quite some time now. We have uh, Rita Valenti, who is a public health nurse. And we have uh, Joyce Mills, who introduced herself earlier as a retired nurse, um, both of whom can comment about the COVID situation nationally and um, particularly, we're concerned with its relationship, of course, to the schools. Uh, we're going to start with Steve Miller from Oakland, uh, who will talk some about the national uh, considerations with COVID in the schools. And uh, let's get some perspective from Steve to start with. Thank you, and welcome, everybody. Um, just to put the issues of choice into some perspective, we have to step back and really look at what happened since COVID hit. Uh, Donald Trump put the market in charge. He embraced states' rights and uh, said, we're not gonna do anything. We don't need a national plan. Uh, all these people can do what they wanna do. So of course, you know, we see the impact of the history of slavery right there, uh, but the, uh, the federal government kicked the ball of testing, uh, uh, tabulating various things, et cetera, et cetera, down to the states. The states kicked it to the local public health agencies. The local public health agencies kicked it to the schools and said, any school can do whatever they want, and it's okay. Um, and so uh, you see the total abdication of the leading role of government here. And so what it did is it set up this situation of personal choice because this government, this country under capitalism really doesn't operate with the idea that there's such a thing as public policy or social choice or public choice. Uh, none of that's discussed. It's just automatically trashed in the usual way until desperate individuals have to make choices because society didn't make the choices that should have been made in the first place. Um, and we see this with uh, the whole issue then of uh, how the uh, fascists have weaponized wearing masks. Uh, when COVID spread around the world, you had the first defiance in Italy. This is after it spread from China into Vietnam and other places in Asia. Italy had the first public defiance where people just said, damn, I'm going to the beach and hanging out. Uh, that of course has swept the Western world and the United States, but then it's, it's taken another step into becoming weaponized and politicized. And so you, uh, you see that uh, the whole issue has shifted in over a little bit more than a year and a half to uh, the idea which everybody articulated at the beginning, we're all in this together, to the idea that uh, uh, it's my right to die and poison my children and kill my family and ruin the schools just because I don't want to follow what is common sense uh, and scientific basis. Um, there's a real lesson in that for all of us. And as we confront uh, the, we have to be compassionate to the people, you know, to some extent, who are refusing to get vaccinated because they've been trashed by this, this reactionary point of view. In, in the polio epidemic, there was no such thing as, as defiance. Everybody operated together. They, um, 
youth schools. I myself as a junior high school uh, kid was uh, drawn in to help uh, pass out the little cups with the sugar cubes. Um, and in the United States, uh, by uh, you had in the in the 60s and the 70s, re, you had first of all uh, a vaccine for measles, but people didn't use it, and uh, that started a movement to vaccinate in schools. By 1981, all states had rules about school vaccinations for diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, polio, measles, mumps, and rubella, uh, and. You know, to be honest, the people who have their kids in school now, those kids have had those shots. Uh, and, you know, it's it's something that we need to use to publicly educate people and wise them up. Uh, but we can see also where fascism is heading with this because the, the fascist governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, uh, uh, you know, poses himself as do the governors of Florida and other Republican governors as fighting from freedom of domination, but they're really fighting for their freedom to dominate. And as soon as they rode this horse, they immediately started passing laws by the government against your right to protect yourself with science and common sense. Uh, so that we've seen a real lesson in how things get politicized, but I think you know, the, the real conclusion is that we can seize these issues and turn them correctly and explain them correctly. Uh, the one fundamental thing that I've learned in this, and I'll close with this, is that in the United States, the common idea is freedom from something, like, like Abbott said, freedom from domination. But actually, what freedom really means is freedom for something freedom not to get sick in schools, freedom to eat, freedom to have a house, et cetera. Uh, and that's the direction that we have to go to counter this uh, historic, I mean, it is a historic idea in the United States, freedom from the king, uh, but not freedom for anything else. Uh, so uh, I, I leave you guys with that. Thank you, Steve, thank you very much. Um, hey, so I want to ask you whether you want to play the uh, a video of uh, Dan Cutter. Yeah, Is I would, because I think he spoke very eloquently. Just um, give me a moment to just set that up. If uh, So let, let me contextualize as I try to type. Dan Cutter is a part-time professional um, with my union. I, I work for the Cook County College Teachers Union, and I'm a chapter chair, and he is very active in the um the the contract committee that we're we just started negotiating last uh actually this week which maybe i'll mention a little bit because you know the problem is that the rulers won't give you anything if you don't fight for it and he he gave one of the most compelling speeches regarding covid and what his college and the city colleges are facing across the district but he also, uh, Malcolm X is a health center. If you don't know, uh, a while back, some corporate moron decided to um, specialize the, the city colleges. I work at Harold Washington, he works at Malcolm X. And Malcolm X has become the hub for, um, for health. But what's happened, unfortunately, is that they've limited, they've, it's just been a disaster. And um, Malcolm X has had to date, they just sent out another announcement 20 COVID cases. And part of that may be because of the healthcare work they do, but mostly it's because they really don't have any safety in place. So just let me cue this up and then I will get to that part. No, we have. Okay, sorry, I apologize. So I, I don't think uh, he was feeling well because he never misses. Um, he never misses meetings and he wasn't at the contract action team meeting. So I don't know if he caught the crud that's going around or what, but um, yeah, so you get to hear from Dan Cutter. All right, here we go. So this was at the board meeting uh, on October 7th. Mm -hmm. I always tell my students in speech class to never make assumptions about what their audience does and does not know. So I do want to remind people we're in a pandemic. 
Since the start of September, there have been 19 cases reported on the campus of Malcolm X College, our healthcare college, where I am one of those part-time tutors who has to go into the building to tutor and do work almost entirely remotely. Utilizing the healthcare plan for part-time professionals at City Colleges results in nearly premiums of $1,000 to pay every single month, more than half of much of people's paychecks biweekly at City Colleges. How are we supposed to pay for healthcare and rent during a pandemic? Uh, how many people, if we surveyed all the tutors at, or all the other part-time professionals at City Colleges, how many would say that they've put off a doctor's visit or a COVID test out of fear of what those results would mean and what their bank accounts would be after going to the hospital? I have, and I'm young and healthy. I can't count the number of my coworkers who live in fear of going to the doctor right now because we don't have good healthcare options. So I would like to highlight two of my coworkers from the Academic Support Center at Malcolm X College today because while I have issues, I think their issues speak to part-time professionals as a whole. First, I want to talk about my coworker, Natalie. Natalie should be retired, but she's not yet. She's closer to 80 than she is to 70. Uh, and one of the reasons why she isn't is because she helps take care of her grandchildren, both financially as well as through support. Right? In the summer of last year in 2020, the former director of the Academic Support Center unilaterally cut tutors' hours by 37% in July of 2020, because there was a drop in enrollment for the fall by 37%. She cut our hours two months before the fall semester based off of justification of enrollment, with two more months to bring those enrollment numbers up. This meant that while Natalie could come to work and smile and give the best tutoring possible she could for students in reading in support of ESL, right? But it means that she couldn't financially support her grandchildren the way that she wanted to. But someone else who I want to talk about is my coworker, Britt. Britt has been with the City Colleges for over seven years. She's one of the most committed educators I know. She's one of the bravest people I know. I left work at Malcolm X early from her baby shower to come here because she's giving birth in 10 days. And because of the cuts from our previous boss at the Academic Sports Center, she fell below the 15 hours on average worked on the calendar year, which took away her benefits as a part-time employee at the city colleges, and she doesn't have maternity. Her birthday is in 10 days. How is this happening in the city of Chicago, of, of the richest country in the history of the world, and we're just allowing these educators, these people who believe so fiercely in the, the pursuit of public education to just let them slip through the cracks like this. Um, something else that I want to say. In the city colleges, part-time professionals have been left behind constantly. Thank we you, mentor Heather, your time's up. I would like to end with the words from the alderman of the 20th Ward, Jeanette Taylor. Don't give us crumbs and tell us it's cake. I don't know why, oh my gosh, every time I hear that speech, it makes me want to cry because it's so unconscionable. Um, and I also represent the part-time tutors. So they're, they're really experiencing difficulties that shouldn't be, and they get constantly shit on, you know? So it's, it's tough to watch that speech again, but um, yeah. That was Dan Cutter, part-time professional. He was supposed to be here, but like I said, I don't know if he's not feeling well or what. Lou, do you want me to go next? Yes, please. All right. So first I want to apologize. My son was going to be here, but it's Halloween. So he's like in vacation mode and he's like, mom, I can just come in for a little bit. And I was like, no, no, no. I know how your little bits go. But I did post an article that he wrote, um, which encompasses a lot of his concerns from the CPS perspective super eloquent. Um, he's been helping the, the People's Response Network, which we're members of in Chicago. And like I was saying earlier, Howard's a member of, but I am a, um, uh, the chapter chair in my union. I'm a full-time faculty member in the English department. And I've been working in Chicago since 2004. So I've seen decades of incompetence and uh, really no, no regard for workers or students when it comes to the privatizing of our educational system. And what COVID has done, like it has done in many systems, is that it's shown the glaring inequalities, not just in terms of how students are treated, but in terms of how workers are treated. And right now it's, it's a really difficult moment because 
what the city has done is basically divide the employees so that faculty got the option to do remote work and I'm very grateful. And in fact, I have the option to work remotely next semester because I wanted to, I don't, I don't feel safe in these conditions and I'll explain why, but the part-time professionals and full-time professionals did not get that option, which is really disgusting because a majority of the, of the students are taking classes remotely. Um, and they did poll them, they did a poll where they asked students, do you want to come back into the building? A third of them want to continue doing remote work, a third of them want to do online work, and a third want to be face-to-face. -face. And even that, I think we should parse out a little more. Um, but this wasn't because the administration sent out the surveys, no. Student government sent out the surveys. There were independent surveys that were sent because the city's not interested in safety. The city's interested in making money. Like the CPS school system is interested in, in uh, saving money. And so we, my union, I'm very proud of my union. Even though we're small, we're about 5,000 members. We fought consistently, even though we haven't been winning as much as we like. We've been fighting consistently for safety. Um, I've been a part of almost every conversation with the attorneys. And from every stupid thing that you can think of, from having spray for people to clean desks, to having wipes, to pushing for uh, the, those visors for people who are working in person, which were like the art department and lab sciences and, and whatnot. But they've been really egregious in that um, they, they set a new telework. Telework is what the, the form we signed for people to come back to the building or not. But they set up this new telework form that favors non, non bargain for people like administrators, right? So they'll have the option to work remotely if they want to. And they're tying it into online learning, but it's, it's ridiculous, right? We should have the option to work remotely until the majority of people are vaccinated. And the majority of people are not vaccinated. Uh, last time we, we took statistics, it was like 60%. A high number of people in black and brown communities are still not vaccinated. The janitors don't want to get vaccinated. Um, and there are pockets for historical reasons and others that don't want to get the vaccine, yet there are no safety measures for them other than wearing a mask, right? Um, we still haven't found evidence that they're using HEPA filters. We've been asking for it. Uh, so we're concerned that one, they're not cleaning properly. I know this because we have like four full-time janitors on staff. This is a one building situation at Harold Washington, which also makes it very dangerous because we can't open the windows to circulate air. So there's a lot of problems. And we've had, uh, let me see how many cases at Harold Washington. I, I wanna say seven, this is week 10. It's not as bad as Malcolm X, but it's a concern. And you know, um, they're just really, really uh, absurd. The other thing too, like, like CPS, we, we have gotten millions of dollars in COVID funds. And I, I don't know what they've done with that money. Um, one of the things we did win recently as a local is that they didn't want to reimburse us for tech or Wi-Fi. And then when they gave us the agreement, they completely cut out the professionals. And that pissed the professionals off and rightly so. So we're like, no, we agreed unanimously. Either everybody gets it or nobody gets it. And I think the administration thought they were going to divide us in this issue. We're like, no, fuck you. Everybody gets, I'm sorry, sorry. I just, this is a, a heated issue for us. So they, they said, okay, then you can have your reimbursement for, for computers and Wi-Fi, but we'll tell you how much we will reimburse you for the computers, right? And so I don't care. As long as everybody gets a little something, because a lot of us have children. And then when they were remote learning, we had to increase our Wi-Fi speed, right? And I, I know I did because I had three kids remote learning at home and then I had to teach full time. And there were a number of professionals that for whatever reason, they wouldn't let them take the larger monitors home, which is so stupid. And so they had to make, they had to, you know, buy technology to support the students. So a lot of these efforts that we've done, it's not because we're greedy. It's not because we want money. We did, we did the purchases to help our students. Uh, you think I want to be paying 86 bucks a month for Wi-Fi? Hell no. I'd rather be using that for something else. But I wanted to make sure that my students got a, a quality uh, live stream when I taught them. So it's, it's a, there's, there's a lot of problems still. We're still fighting for clarity, uh, pushing for, for our professionals to have their remote option, pushing for, um, we're gonna, I know even though they're, they're agreeing to the process, they're gonna mess it up. They're gonna do something that throws a monkey bridge and people don't get reimbursed. We've also asked that they reduce the number of students in the classroom and we haven't gotten that agreement. And so I think um, the, the administration, the city colleges is living in a fantasy land like the pandemic doesn't exist. Um, and really the only thing they're mandating is weekly testing. And not even, I, I heard from a professional yesterday at a chapter meeting that she gets her results back 50% of the time. 
Like, really? What is that? That is, that's ridiculous. And so now we're going to have to bargain about that, right? So there are a lot of problems, but at the same time, we're, we're at a position where um, we're starting to, to really organize and like, look, the issue with a lot of unions is that they tend to work in silos. This is a problem. Even though they've been fighting for remote, I've been pushing for us to unite with other sectors, with other unions, with other parents, like the PRN, you know? Um, and so I'm hoping that, that that'll continue. And I, I, uh, it's, it's a very difficult membership to move sometimes because the previous leadership in the union made it so hierarchical and difficult for people to participate. And so even though we've been trying to break that up, like they don't see themselves as people who need to fight for what they need. And they should see themselves that way because I'm telling you the administration is gonna give them nothing. So that, that, uh, that's what I gotta say about the city colleges. Um, yeah, and that was it. Hopefully I wasn't too far over, Lou. Oh. That's fine. Uh... We need we need that perspective. Um, what I wanted to do here at this point is to see whether uh, we could call on a couple other people to give some other perspectives, and then I want to ask Hesu uh, to close out this segment with uh, for you to give some of Antonio's perspective as well. Sure, of course. So for uh, I I want to ask uh, first of all. Uh, since we have a couple of people also from the People's Response Network, I want to ask um, Howard uh, and then Kathy to say a couple words um, to chime in here. Howard, would you, Howard Ehrman, um, little, <clears throat> excuse me, little, vis I know Howard as going back to the Little Village uh, Environmental Justice Organization years ago. Uh, but he's been a, a consistent fighter for social justice and public health in the city of Chicago for quite some time. So, Howard, uh, let's hear a few words from you. Uh, if you don't mind, if Kathy could go first, just because I've got another call now about about a COVID patient. So, if <laughs> sure. Kathy could go first, that'd be great, and then I'd be happy. Sure. Come on. Sure, uh, Kathy. How about you? Okay. Uh, rant before health. <laughs> rant before health. But we, we've been, uh, can you hear me, first of all? Yes. I get looks like I'm not. Okay. Uh, what we've been observing and witnessing is a, uh, a, a mass murder of our children, of our families, of our community by the neglect of the legislature I, I listened yesterday to uh, city council. It was very, very painful. Mm. They were talking about how wonderful it is that they have Dr. Arwadi as, as our, our health commissioner and how they look, look to her through this whole pandemic. And it's like the whole thing is over. Like there is no more pandemic. And that's insane. I call her Dr. Quack Quack, and I'm going to continue to call her Dr. Quack Quack. So if you see it on the internet, you'll know who I'm talking about. She, uh, Howard, when he comes back, he'll he'll tell you about Dr. Quack Quack and her her uh, her. She she doesn't have any credentials to do what she's doing. And she comes on. She comes on to the the uh, social uh, social media a few times a week, and it's a ask Dr. Arwadi quack quack uh, ask her a question. And you you think you would think that you know you're typing in something and that she's answering your question. No, that's not what's going on at all. The whole thing is scripted. She answers whatever questions she wants to uh, answer uh, because she knows what the questions are that she probably wrote them. I don't know. I met Dr. Awadi back in the day when she was uh, the, uh, the first deputy of uh, um, Julie Morita, who was at the time the commissioner of public health. And Julie Marita had, had a whole thing about how we really don't need public mental health centers. That's how I even got on this, this thing about her. 
And toward the end of her term, Julie Morita wouldn't even come to the city council meetings to, to deliver the news that she wasn't for public mental health centers. She would send Dr. Arwadi. So when it came time for Dr. Arwadi to be approved by the city council, the city council said no, she didn't get approved the first time. And of course, you know, the way way things go, backdoor done deals, and like, you know, if if uh, and the mayor has a real strong stance on if you don't vote the way I want you to vote, your your constituents aren't gonna get anything. Your ward isn't gonna get anything. And uh, Jeanette Taylor actually uh, came out and testified to that fact that that's exactly what what she was doing. That went around like when the first budget was being passed last year and the people who voted no one, it got like nasty emails in their, in their inboxes from, uh, from the mayor. And uh, you know, this is, this is, these are our leaders. These are our leaders. And uh, you know, it, it's time, it's time for the people. It's time for the people to take it in hand because you, you can't tell a Republican from a Democrat anymore. We, we got the build back less deal coming. It, it's, it's just, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's so painful to, to witness this and, not, and be so helpless not to be able to do anything about this. Uh, we have some really great parents in CPS and and uh, and uh, people who have decided to homeschool who said, "I'm not putting my child in in jeopardy. I'm not sending my children to school." So uh, yeah, <laughs> the schools have have. Uh, unequally decided how they're going to deal with kids who don't show up to school. Uh, some people say, oh, don't show up the first day, we're unenrolling them. Now, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where, where, they're, where, where they even come up with their strategies. I guess it's just a bully strategy. But if they lose, lose enrollment, they lose funding. Eventually, if they keep it up, they're going to lose their certification. Fortunately, now we, we've got we've got the vaccine. But I I just uh, um, volunteered to be a local school council member at my local school, and when I went in to put in my application, I observed in the hallway like very young children in line going somewhere. And they were almost like shoulder to shoulder. And there was a whole hallway empty. There was no reason why they couldn't be spaced out, but it wasn't being done. So I had to be real, real good. Oh, you would have been so proud of me. I had to be really good. I'm the first call for the local school council and not bring it up at all, just so I could get elected, so I could get in there. So uh, our, our next meeting, I'm, I'm, I'm locked and loaded, everybody. This is wrong. This is, uh, we've got to, we've got to take, take charge because uh, nobody else is. It, 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 the deal is, here's the deal. Get those kids back in school. Get the hell back to work and make money for us. That's the deal. And Thanks, I Kathy. oppose it. <laughs> Good words. Thanks, Kathy. Okay. Um, Howard, can uh, up, up to you now, back in your court, mm -hmm. your court. Yeah, thank you so much uh, to Jesus and to Lou and everybody else for uh, inviting us to participate. <clears throat> uh, I want to sort of cut to the chase here. I What's needed, in my opinion, is that we need to build a local, regional and national united front in the historical meaning of that word from 1920 to 1936 until it was destroyed. And that united front can be around a lot of things, but at least on a 10 point program for education, schools, 
um, health and anything else we want to put in there. There's a need to break down all of these silos, as Jesus talked about, and this is the time to do it. What's happening is that <clears throat> tens of millions of parents and families are getting pushed from both sides. On the one side, they have been told by the pundits, by the President of the United States, um, by the liberal sellout academics and others, that you're a terrible parent if you don't send your child back to school. And I'm speaking here as a grandparent of two Chicago Public School students. I have another four-year-old granddaughter in Wisconsin, which is even far worse. And then on the other hand, um, if they courageously, as Jesu and other parents have done, keep their kids home from school because they know they don't need a public health doctor. They don't need, they ignore all the lies uh, from the President Biden of the United States to Anthony Fauci, uh, to Walensky, the head of the CDC, all the lies that have enabled, enabled tens of thousands of people to die, especially since May 13th, uh, when Walensky said to take off the mask um, to everything else that she's done. <clears throat> They've ignored those lies to do everything they can that's built into our primordial DNA more than anything else to protect their children by keeping them at home. Then they're threatened uh, by the local school districts or even possibly the law authorities um, to basically, first of all, disenroll their kids like um, Jesus talked about, but also uh, to take an illegal act and to start proceedings against them. So we've had lots of parents in Chicago uh, who have been threatened um, by the local CPS administrators, either the principals or other people. They've been threatened um, for being truant or basically facilitating truancy. So this is a time where a united front of the left needs to step forward. And for those of you who speak Spanish or know this expression, it's ya basta, uh, which is far more than just saying enough in English. It's time basically to set up defense of the parents, defense of the family. It's time to say that it's the absolute democratic right of self-determination for every family, student, and parent to decide if they want to keep their kids home from school and to have an expanded, improved uh, online option, or I think Hezu has a better word to use. Um, but it's time for the left to get their act together and I'm just going to spend a minute on this, and I'm going to make a proposal that whoever wants to, uh, starting with the national organization that's, that's sponsoring this, we need to develop a draft of this United Front 10-point program by Thanksgiving, if not sooner. Um, and so what, what do I mean by the left? Um, my view of how the left has responded to this, um, having been a Marxist-Leninist uh, since 1966, has been far weaker than the incredible weakness we had before COVID. Uh, what has the left done primarily? Um, and I don't know the particulars of your organization, but primarily what the left has done is number one, lots of people into Medicare for all. You know, we can discuss and debate whether that's a great uh, thing to do, but let's say we had Medicare for all on December 31st, 2019, when the Chinese government officially reported this disease to the WHO, um, most of the people still would have died. People don't understand the difference between access to primary health care, which is a legitimate fight, uh, a fight for human rights and public health. Um, so that's number one. Number two is lots of people got involved in giving away food, helping people get to health care. Those are all wonderful things, but it's not being in the con it's not being done in the context of dual power, of basically creating our own system within the system and at the same time fighting the state. So that's number two. Uh, number three is um, most people on the left just go along with what the Biden administration has done. Um, how many people got up and said anything about Walensky saying, take off your masks on May 13th and actually try to develop a movement against that, either at the local, regional, or national level? That's killed tens of thousands of people in the last five months. Uh, how many people said anything when Walensky first changed six feet social distancing in schools to three feet, and then basically by June said, oh, it doesn't matter. If you can't do it, you don't have to. Uh, how many people did anything about the fact that there has never been, never in the history of health or public health, the massive amount of privatization, first by the Trump administration, but then far greater 
by the Biden administration. And I'll give you one example. For the first time in history, every health department in this country, which are local and state health departments, because the, the federal government has very little authority over this disease, which is something if people want to discuss, we can. Um, they basically have privatized whatever they can. So what they did is Biden out Trump Trump by saying health departments are no longer going to get vaccines that go to pharmacies. We're going to ship them directly to CVS and Walgreens, which has wasted more vaccine than anybody else in the world, which gets 40 to $175 per shot for the uninsured, insured, or Medicare, et cetera, et cetera. This has massively increased the inequity racially and by class lines that existed before COVID. So these are some of the things we have to do. And I think the thing that we have in common, uh, I believe it was Alan who started this off or somebody else, is that we have to say that schools have to be opened as vaccine centers. Uh, that's one of several points on a 10 point program that have to be done. The people have to be hired who are the school parents and other people in the local neighborhoods to help with this vaccine program, to help with the disaster of contact tracing, uh, to help with the disaster of testing, and most and foremost, to help with financial and other kind of aid so that families can safely stay at home, uh, both to educate their kids, but also if they have isolation and quarantine. So there's a lot more to talk about, um, but that's just some of it. Thank you. That's a, uh, that's a, a very appreciate the, uh, the comments and the suggestions. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to discuss a whole lot more uh, after we have a brief, um, I don't want to say break, it's really not a break, it's an opportunity to, to listen to one of our uh, wonderful poets from San Francisco and musician. Actually, Lou, uh, didn't you want me to talk about Antonio real quick? Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, no, it's okay. Um, yeah, just go ahead. Because look, Look, my son has been on, we, we took a family vote about whether the kids should go to school or not. And what happened is that the first week of school, um, a family brought two children that were COVID positive. One was in my son's class and the class went to quarantine uh, the following Wednesday. And so that was my terror. That was my fear. I started doubting myself thinking I was a terrible parent because I didn't want to send the kids to school um, I have to note that Antonio was on the debate team while he was remote and he really wanted to go back to the debate team. So there were a number of reasons my husband was pushing for it, but then I pulled them and they didn't want my daughter to be pulled because she wasn't affected, which is BS. I pulled her as well. They, a lot of administrators try to talk me out of it. Um, since then, they have not gone back to school. But what my son told me was happening in the building made me even more concerned. And you have to understand that this school um, which is National Teachers Academy, is historically militant. They fought the city when they wanted to make their school a high school for the bourgeoisie that were moving in. I mean, the, the property values now near the school are ridiculous. I tried buying a house and the cheapest house was like $2 million. But they fought the city for over two years and they won. So this is a very united school. But on this issue, they haven't been so united because, um, well, I, I got to say it's because the union sent people back to work. And uh, that, that was part of the, the error, I, I believe. Um, and they also want to protect their school and the principal, which I respect, I understand. But they haven't been as nasty as some other administration, which I'm very grateful for. They've done some things that were kind of, you know, like for example, Antonio went back to, to work on the debate team and like an idiot, I celebrated on Facebook and like within minutes I was told he couldn't participate anymore. And I, I think it crushed me more than it crushed my son but they had just made him the debate team captain and then they ripped it away from him. You know, they won't send us homework packets because supposedly there's a policy that says that students can't get homework packets if they're not going to school, which I really call bullshit on. Um, but what he told me was happening in the schools was that kids weren't wearing the mask properly. The teachers weren't wearing their masks because they believe the head of the CDC who says, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask, which Howard and other doctors will tell you it's not true. You can still spread the virus. He was very concerned that as a, as a sixth grader, his class had to move um, at least three times and no cleaning was happening between the moves. And it's, it's hard. I understand the, the janitors are overworked, like the city colleges, they don't have enough staff. Um, another thing he was very concerned with is the only place where they actually did social distancing was at the lunchroom 
But then when people were dispersed or collected, there was no social distancing. So a lot of these things haven't concerned. And now he's very angry because they limited the amount of quarantine. I don't know if you saw the article where uh, Lori Lightfoot said that she was going to try to minimize quarantine because it caused chaos. This was a few weeks ago. I mean, how criminal and disgusting is that? And they lowered the amount of quarantine to 10 days. Based on what? This is so fucking infuriating. Like if you know two weeks, 14 days is the minimum to guarantee that they're not carrying the virus, why shorten that? It doesn't make any sense at all to me as a mother and it makes no sense to my son. So currently, you know, um, on a personal note, I gotta say that my son and I both go to counseling because I, I think we have very similar personalities and we, 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 uh, we, don't, we don't expect the best from the city or the mayor. Um, that his main concern is with uh, long COVID. What happens if he gets long COVID? What is gonna be the impact on him or his little sister who he shares a bedroom with, they play together, they hug each other, you know? Um, so this is really a concern and, and the, the, you know, well, who knows? Cause they haven't done any studies to show what's gonna be the long-term effect of COVID on kids who get it when they're young. So he, he is very concerned. I, I don't think he's gonna go back to school. Um, if by the time he gets vaccinated, he doesn't feel comfortable going back or the science shows that there's still a high risk, I, I will definitely have to throw into homeschooling. Homeschooling is hard. I work full time. I run my union. I do my activism. It is really difficult to be a good, a good homeschool mother. And we try to integrate a lot of curriculum. He does really great work with the PRN. Um, we're reading Bracero history. He does journal writings once a week, but that's not an education per se. So we're going to really have to step up our game if that happens. And uh, but it is a lot of work. And I really empathize with the parents who are keeping their kids home, especially when the kid wants to go back to school and the parent knows that's not the right thing to do. I also have no faith in the city when they roll out these vaccines. I, I think Howard mentioned this. We call the COVID race as apartheid. Which of the communities that are gonna get the least vaccines? Black and brown communities. My son goes to a predominantly African-American school. Uh, black and brown students are primarily who goes to the city colleges. So I have, I have no faith in, in, in the government. I have no faith in how they're gonna roll out the vaccine. Um, and it's gonna be a continued concern in case the virus mutates because as long as you have a large population of people that are not getting vaccinated, this thing is not gonna stop. So that's, that's what I have to say on behalf of Antonio, who's enjoying himself. He is Ash from the Evil Dead today, running around with this boomstick, you know? If you know Ash and the Evil Dead, it's a great, great, great TV um, and movie. So that, that's it. And thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak on his behalf. Um, he's also been a phenomenal little activist. Howard will tell you that he'll pick up the mic and speak truth to power, you know, <laughs> any chance he gets. So thank you. Well, thank you, Hesu, for, for representing uh... Antonio, it's very helpful for us. I think it's it's time for us to uh, take a little opportunity to think for a few minutes and reflect while um, Scott Bird, a uh, magnificent poet from San Francisco and also musician, helps us transition to the next part of the program. Uh, so Scott, please take it away. Thank you guys for inviting me. This is good discussion and I think it's an important one uh, to carry on. I'm in my, I'm in my Dia de los Muertos uh, mode today um, as we're kind of honoring the poets and the people who have gone before us. Um, people who have, we have lost to COVID in the last year. Um, and this is a piece that I performed um, at the Cultural Offensive uh, League meeting a couple of Sundays ago, which some of you were a part of. Um, and I'm happy to do it again. I'm thinking of um, Comrade Victor Hara, uh, this song, Manifiesto, uh, which bleeds in from a, from a poem that I wrote um, called I Watched. <clears throat> so I hope you enjoy it. I watched the lead belly of the mountain grow bare of ice caps and snow. 
I watch the river slow down to a trickle. I watch the lumber poor carpenter falter in the streets and barter his last dime for a nickel. I watched a young girl learn to paint before she learned to write, and she taught me how to see the fish in the trees. I watched the Dene grandmother dig a finger's well in the earth to quench the thirst of her dying flock of sheep. And I watched her ladle a cup of mineral to slake her own red dirt throat. And I watched the mother redwood tell her children to sweat in their red coats. I watched the spider woven wool of the nape of fire over the swept forest floor. And I watched a baby take its first steps and dance in the threshold of the open door. I watch the changing leaves of autumn give way to a dry, dry cold. I watch the old man roll his last cigarette and dump his tobacco fold. I watch the branch divide and I watch the people hide and the halls of justice flooded to the pillars by an unjust tide. And I saw the rich and powerful take a ride for a colony on Mars. And I watched them streak across the sky and I heard the screaming stars. I watched the wicked, wicked thing and I watched it in its death throes. I watched though the brain trembles, the broken hearted know. I watched as a child watches the first of the falling snow and watches waiting i think i'll no longer watch and wait i think i'll no longer think i think from now on i'll just sing Canto por cantar, ni por tener buena voz. Canto porque la guitarra tiene sentido y razón. Tiene corazón de la tierra. Y a las de palomita es como el agua bendita, santigua glorias y penas. Aquí se encajó mi canto, como dijera Violeta. Guitarra trabajadora con olor a primavera que no es canto de ricos ni cosa que se parezca. Canto es como los andamios por alcanzar las estrellas. Que el canto tiene sentido cuando palpitan las venas. De que el morirá cantando las verdades verdaderas. No las linsojas fugaces ni las famas extranjeras. 
sino el canto de una londra hasta el fondo de la tierra. Allí de donde llega todo y donde todo comienza. Canto que ha sido valiente, siempre será canción nueva. Siempre será canción nueva. Siempre será canción nueva. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. I think that uh, adds a huge amount to our program. Um, okay. We're now in the section that uh, we want to have discussion, comments, uh, from everybody, and I'm particularly interested in people who, first of all, who haven't spoken so far. And so um, I'm interested, first of all, in seeing uh, whether Joyce or uh, Rita, Joyce Mills or Rita Valenti want to comment on, the, on what they see so far. I'd be glad to, but Rita, do you want to go first or? Go ahead, Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> so much great stuff. And I just wanted to say, starting off, my first feeling is that, you know, this work that's happening in Chicago and other places at this local level um, around the schools and health, I mean, I think this is opening up the whole um, process right now to just a just a whole section of society is got the potential to become um, really politicized in a good way, and hopefully we can save some kids and uh, teachers and parents in the process. Um, I put in the chat just quickly. I was noticing that. Uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil has been charged with inciting a pandemic and uh, crimes against humanity. And the ex health minister is running for head of state against him. I think, you know, we're looking at the beginning of a very different period around, um, around this process. And I'm really um, I'm so inspired by the work that you're all doing. Um, there's so much to say, but I think one thought that I, I had is that, you know, public health people, people who are looking at it from all different kinds of perspectives um, are beginning to recognize um, one thing that, that Her Howard said, this whole question of, uh, how much we have separated the public's health from access to insurance for medical care, um, how much we've separated all of that from every other aspect of life. And I think the political moment is that that can't be done anymore. And I really agree with that. I think we've seen a, as a public health nurse, but also as a grandmother, I have um, two granddaughters who both had COVID. My son has had COVID. They currently, um, my son is struggling. He's a single dad, struggling really hard around the same things you're talking about, whether to send the kids to school or not. 
Um, the kids need to be in school desperately because of his situation, but they also need to be safe. And the whole history of CPS. So I, I, I really feel like I get, you know, what you're t Steve and I are dealing with this. But you know, I think that the 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 process that we're in is to do both this fight for our kids and whatever we need to do. I mean, keep them home, whatever. I mean, fight them, the CPS taking them, what all those things have to happen. But I really agree that the other process that has to happen at the same time is to hold these motherfuckers responsible, you know, because this isn't over. It's not the last time we're going to be dealing with a pandemic. And the reality of it is that we don't have a public health infrastructure in this country anymore. I've actually, in my period of working, have seen as a nurse, have seen it totally destroyed in my lifetime. Even the um, aspects of it that were paternalistic and had all these other problems that we were fighting as workers in this process for so many years, they've destroyed it. They don't have a public health infrastructure. So the idea of, of remaking it through the schools or whatever is, is very valid and, and, and absolutely critical. But the reality of it is we need to do it as much as possible, we can do models, but we have to hold government responsible for having a public health response. And it does have to start with masking and distancing and the things that everybody can do. This is this the politicization that we're faced with is <coughs> really on the on the front lines. And I think that it's not, you know, they just coming out with all of the information about how many essential workers have died in this process, um, you know, there was always a kind of a covering of that fact. You know, it was mostly old people or people who were too fat or people who were too, you know, disabled with some other disease or what have you. But it's so clear that it's not just about people who are against vaccines. This, this whole movement that's beginning to evolve, whether they are against vaccines or not, is for, protecting our children. And the reality is that um, they're not protected and they're not getting an education. And the, the people who are working are, you know, in, in these environments where there's no protection for any of us are dying. Um, and I think that, you know, I guess, you know, I know Rita will say more from the South and, and so forth, but even in areas like Oakland and the Bay Area and places that, you know, you would think are historically progressive, there is absolute chaos around this question of how to move forward. And it's not just the left, but it certainly includes people who thought they had a handle on the next step. So I, I'll end there for now. I think um, there's a lot more to say, but um, yeah, uh, bravo. I think, you know, we're really at a political moment that requires um, us to do something very, very different and very new. Um, and yeah, we've got the people to do it. Rita, um, want to jump in for a few minutes? Okay. Uh Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, having us. And thank you so much, uh, Kathy Powers, Howard, Hezu, everybody that has made uh, such so important, uh, such an important sharing, S so profound uh, comments about the way that this pandemic and the lack of an effective government response is hitting at the very hearts of our families, particularly now with this question of kids in the school. Uh, I'm Rita, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, on unceded uh, Muskegee Creek land and the, you know, it's clear to me that uh, one of the old statements, as the South goes, so goes the nation and Wall Street controls the South, is what I'm seeing now. Because here, you know, the crisis around the pandemic is, is very, very stark. Um, uh, 
the governors in the South, Camp, DeSantis, uh, the Texas governor, Ivy, Alabama, all of that. We have the lowest vaccination rates in the country. Um, we have the highest rates of health disparity in the country. Uh, and we have less, say, for example, in Georgia, less than 50% of the population vaccinated. And that's for a whole variety of reasons. I want to just say one word about that. I think it's really important, particularly with his comments about how we need to break down silos, how we need to come together, how we need to build uh, organization together, that we can't blame the unvaccinated on the nature of this crisis. I think the crisis really resides in some of the things that J Joyce has spoken of, which is the total destruction of any kind of public health infrastructure. And even the duality and the history of the duality of that public health infrastructure that has left so many uh, lacking any trust, both in government and in public health, particularly when you look at the history of eugenics in this country, which the South has experienced. Um, uh, it, it, to an overwhelming, uh, 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 in, in overwhelming ways and even very recently. But I wanted to just share a little bit about what's going on here. Um, state schools, for example, co state colleges, community colleges that are state, all of those have banned being able to even wear masks in the classroom. You cannot wear a mask in the classrooms, right? Steve said it, I think, very early in his presentations when he talked about the way this pandemic was kicked from the federal government to the state governments. And I think Howard mentioned, that's the way that public health is actually structured, right? And then the state governments punted it to the counties. The counties punted it to individual school districts. So we have school districts throughout Georgia, just by example, that also ban mask wearing in the classrooms, okay? So, you know, the, the, the way the crisis ex expresses itself here is very, very stark. Um, we also see a lot of very strong fight back uh, in terms of both teachers and uh, uh, professors, particularly recently at UGA in Georgia State, where professors have actually said, we will not teach unless we have mass mandates in the school. So I guess in the South, you know, we're, we're even still struggling with mass mandates, much less um, vaccinations and, and have a way to go. Um, I, I think one of the things that's being lost uh, in, in what I think another person has said on this call, which I think is, is really important is this, this sort of notion that some kind of way the pandemic's over. It is not over, but it is being treated as if it's over, right? We were all, you know, we, we were all hopeful uh, that the CDC would uh, get some strength, some, some uh, uh, enforcement possibilities, et cetera. And what we've seen is, is that the faces may change, but the institutions remain the same and they remain very compromised and they remain uh, very much uh, uh, in the throes of any, of, of what their political self-interest may be, which is usually not what the interest of our people is. Um, we now just just a couple more things and and then I'll stop because I, I I think you know Chicago is really I'm I'm really impressed with this conversation because I think Chicago is really trying to grapple with you know how do we use you know the, the fact that our children's lives are being put at risk to develop a higher level of not only political consciousness but also political organization so that we're capable of defending the the most fundamental thing in our lives, which is our families, right? Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, to me, one of the crucial things about this is, again, this lack of a public health infrastructure that is scientifically rigorous, uh, is community-based and trusted, 
and nationally coordinated. And I hear what Howard is saying, you know, yes, it's important to expand Medicaid. Yes, it's important uh, for Medicare for all, but without a grassroots trusted and scientifically strong system on the ground, it's not going to be enough. And that to me is so much of what the pandemic has shown. The last thing I wanted to say, and, and I, it relates to what I think a lot of people, uh, I see Howard just put it in the chat, um, you know, is happening is this drive toward fascism, right? And I think one of the key components of that drive toward fascism is the throwing of science under the bus, right? I mean, we're now, you know, and, and there's just, it's a very textured and multifaceted question to try to find scientific truth when you've got a moving target. I mean, the coronavirus is still a novel virus, right? We still don't know everything we need to know about it, right? And so how is it that people can trust uh, institutions that are making proclamations about what to do when uh, those proclamations constantly change? And uh, I couldn't agree more with the fundamental mistake that was made May 13th when it was, uh, you know, it was like, where are you living, Walensky, you know, where you're saying unvaccinated people can take their masks off. And that's what we're, that's what we're seeing now. Um, just, just to close out, um, there, there are two last things to say. And, and one is, again, great appreciation uh, for what you're doing. And also um, a, a, a recognition that we now, and I don't know if folks know this, you know, more people in the United States have died of coronavirus than died during the, what's called the great pandemic, right? The, um, the also called the Spanish flu, although it was probably started here in military bases during World War I. 740,000 people, hundreds of children, one child, one person is enough uh, uh, that could have been prevented. And we had Burks, who was uh, Trump's um, uh, sycophant uh, healthcare uh, so-called person, you know, basically uh, come to terms and say, yeah, we could have saved hundreds of thousands of people if we had done it right. But the throwing of science under the bus, the, um, the, the, the intentional uh, misinformation that is also put out, uh, you know, really challenges us to be, to be focused, to be uh, concentrated, to look for the truth and to try to build a kind of uh, politically strong and politically independent uh, organizations that we need in order to, you know, literally save ourselves. Uh, I just read recently where, I mean, in the health disparities, particularly, you know, with black and brown communities in the South, I think the children uh, that we've seen so far uh, are more, at, uh, that five times as many children of color have uh, become infected with the coronavirus than white kids. If you take that to the next level globally, what we know is that high income countries, which have less than one fifth of the global population have purchased more than 50% of the vaccines. Um, and the very last thing, I know I, I can go on, I'm sorry. I mean, it's, it's been a passion and, an, and, a, and, a, and a rage uh, in, in, in my bones for, for, um, for quite some time. Um, the, the, well, I, I guess I can, I mean, we, we are at a transition point, right, in history. I think most of us know that. And a transition point is a very um, painful and can be very chaotic, but there is no return to normal. We have to go forward. We can't promote uh, a return to normal. And yet at the same time, history informs us. You know, one thing, and then I promise I will stop, Steve said early on was, you know, how the kids lined up for the polio vaccine. Well, it's also true that the uh, discoverers of the vaccine, the creators of the vaccine, prohibited, forbid it from being patented, right? That private ownership of necessaries for our own health, right? Uh, Salk and the others uh, uh, prohibited that 
from uh, 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 being privately patented. And now, you know, it's like, okay, well, what we do with the vaccine depends on what Pfizer wants us to do, you know, uh, uh, what Pfizer and Moderna, uh, you know, how they will continue to enrich uh, their profits. And by the way, which I'm sure most of you know, those vaccines have already been paid for at least three times over. Uh, by the public in their formulation. So thank you again. I'm sorry to go on so long. I wasn't intending to, but I bring you greetings from the South. Um, I feel your pain. We feel your pain. And, uh, but I also am full of a sense of, of uh, revolutionary optimism about the potential for us to come together stronger uh, e that, than even before the pandemic began. Rita, I said you're you're my new hero, dude. That, that was, I mean, you too, Joyce. But I'm telling you, sisters, this is fucking. I'm sorry. This is what I needed to hear. It's it was it's. Uh, I'm gonna start crying because this has been so fucking stressful, and I, I I appreciate you and comrades that are coming together. A lot of these ideas, amazing. Lou, I don't even know if we need to do the slides. I think let's just go into the conversation. I had this dope thing that was gonna do tech. Check them out. I wanted us to do collaborative work, but. I'd be okay with just conversing and uh, recording the chat. Yeah. That's good. Uh, Rand has his hand up. Let's let's go with Rand. Well, thank you, folks. All these details are important and allows us to understand the process at hand. I'm living in Pfizer country or what we used to call Upjohn. Um, I just try to be real brief. This is capitalism. And capitalism depends upon making a profit off of what? Unpaid labor. So bringing people back to work at whatever cost is the most important thing. And since we have a surplus labor force, the new class, they're expendable. So this allows us to get rid of the aged, the affirmed, those that aren't contributing to society as a whole, myself, I'm retired, um, reduces the burden on the healthcare system when you expire and reduces the burden on the services, my social security, when I expire. And also, side benefit, less pollution, a variety of burden on the overall environment. But let's call it what it is, it's simply. Um, we use the term fascism, but this is a corporate dictatorship. Pfizer is at the head or Upjohn or whoever else owns this international company now. And I can say from experience, we have pollution all over the area of Southwestern Michigan, all the way to Kalamazoo River and throughout history, them pumping water out of the ground without permission, that this is just an example of corporate rule. And what we need to do is simply convey it in a popular format, in a way that people can understand that fascism is the government controlling controlling our lives via the demands or needs for corporations first and foremost and always. Can I just chime in? One of the things I was hoping to do is think about what could be our next steps. And maybe this isn't the only session because I think whether it's a league or the PRN, we're trying to strategize like, what are we gonna do? What are the next steps? And I know that Howard wants to present um, a, a, a that, that'd be great, but uh, maybe think about that too. All right, I'm um, sorry, Lou, I don't mean to take over your job. No, that's, that's fine. I, I was thinking of that. I wanted to see whether there was anybody else who wanted to talk who hadn't spoken yet. And um, uh, Yolanda is, wants to be on stack. So let's ask Yolanda to speak first. Yolanda Cotolco, if you're trying to speak, you're on mute. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Yolanda. Go ahead. You just muted yourself, though, hon. You got on mute, sister. Okay. I I, I saw a, a TV article, a TV thing on Facebook, a camera thing, a newscaster. She said that they found that the ingredients in the COVID vaccine are toxic. Also, I heard on TV, I couldn't hear you saying that the vaccines for children 5 to 11, that they could cause risk for the children. Um, also, that, that I heard from 
from, from people that can be reliable, that are reliable, that the vaccines have DNA. Uh, the reason I'm, I want, I wrote this in the LRNA comments, LRNA comments, because I want to know where somebody could research. I tried to look up in the internet, I couldn't find anything. And I think that's why the reason people are hesitant. We have things now that didn't exist when the measles vaccine was produced and all the other vaccines, thank heaven. So um, I just want to know if anybody knows anything about it or if it will be tabled for a future discussion. Um, I too have grandkids and I have family. Uh, my sisters have, grand have grandkids. Um, it affects me that way. I speak about it with my daughter quite a bit, the vaccine for us, for the kids. She's hesitant to FDA and CDC approve it. But uh, I don't know why. Um, I've been vaccinated twice. I'm not going to get the booster because the vaccines from UC have made me aggressive, which vaccines before never had. So those, if anybody has any questions or knows about the dangers that I have heard and read about, I'd appreciate it. Um, thank you. That's all. Thank you, Yolanda. I appreciate the questions. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> No, thank you, Yolanda. See, you said what I was going to say anyway, so that's fine. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Howard, a um, few minutes from you, and then let's see where we stand. Okay, I just want to respond um, to, to Yolanda. I think uh, I'm really happy you raised those points, Yolanda, because I think we all believe in respectful listening and try to meet people where they're at. Um, so... I'm sure there's other people here who can do this, but I'm happy uh, to meet with you, Yolanda, on the phone, on Zoom, uh, in ingreso espanol, you know, whatever people want to do to discuss those questions. I, I think the main thing that's happened, as we all know, is that there are real questions that lots of people have, millions of people, that make them hesitant to not get the vaccine. Um, and those questions have either never been answered or poorly answered, or the answers are hidden. They're not out in the public. So um, anybody here who wants to do that together, uh, I've done probably a hundred of these sessions since COVID began in Chicago and also nationally and internationally. So I'm happy to do it. I speak Spanish fluently um, and I will also get other people to do it. I think the most important thing though is not to have a public health doctor do it, but to find uh, parents and other peers, teachers, uh, workers uh, to get it done. And I'll just give one example. Um, in, 19, in the early 1970s, uh, when I was a medical student and a resident at Cook County Hospital, which was the largest public hospital at that point in the United States, I literally um, helped take care of three of the victims of Tuskegee who had moved to Chicago. Um, there is a December 7th or 8th video that you can find pretty easily online um, by the daughter and granddaughter. Uh, the granddaughter happens to be, I believe, a, a nurse practitioner. Um, who of, of one of the victims of Tuskegee. I would really encourage people to look at that um, and to really um, digest it. Uh, because of course, the, the three men that I took care of, and as you hear in the video, would be the first ones to line up to get the shot. Um, I think the thing that's happened is primarily it's a question of access and access exacerbates hesitancy. Uh, the more people who want the shot uh, that we can get the shot to, in ways like we've been doing for 170 years, the less you know, hesitancy there be because they're gonna talk to their own family members, their own friends, et cetera, coworkers. But just real briefly, um, tomorrow some of us are gonna be doing a session uh, to review uh, what we did in the Rainbow Coalition uh, in Chicago with led by the Black Panther Party um, and Fred Hampton uh, around health. Um, I can't invite you to this because it's not an open session but certainly I'd be happy to talk to people about this, having been there myself, um, working with both Fred Hampton and Ronald Doc Satchel, who I think some of you know later moved to California. Um, but I, I just wanna briefly explain uh, how I think it relates to this moment. Uh, and that is uh, in the Rainbow Coalition, we did three things. One is we developed a series of free clinics, which the Panthers in the Young Lords and other groups did throughout the country, not just in Chicago. 
Two, we developed community outreach programs, not just about the first time in history that people had been tested for sickle cell, but many other community outreach programs, including door to door, and in some cases going into the workplace. Um, and three, uh, we, we implemented uh, to the degree that we could uh, Lenin's original concept of dual power. Of course, we don't have Soviets then or now, but basically <laughs> we took on the state. Um, this is a really key concept for what a lot of people on the left right now are talking about COVID. Uh, there's a very good professor from University in Toronto who wrote yesterday on a, a big listserv in public health, uh, which maybe some of you belong to, called uh, Spirit of 1848. She said, well, I don't understand why people are taking on the state trying to rebuild public health rather than rebuilding it ourselves. Uh, this is a real common misconception of young people in particular now, uh, whether those young people uh, be par part of BLM or other, other movements that what we have to do is just get ourselves together and form our own health system in this case. Um, certainly that's something that we should do, although it's gotta be more than health system, but we have to continuously come up with demands that come from the people on the state. Uh, demands that include in this case, opening up all schools, particularly black brown neighborhoods uh, to be vaccine centers, hiring the parents from those schools and other neighborhood residents to work, not just for vaccines, but to work for the failed contact tracing programs of 99% of the states and cities, to work on the failed testing programs of 99% of the states and cities, to provide direct financial assistance that's already available through the state that a lot of people don't know about or can't access uh, to the parents, to the families, to be able to stay home to either educate their kids or be in isolation or quarantine. So those are just some of the points. Um, I'd be happy to talk offline about this, but I think the most important thing is I'd really put it to everyone here that we'd need another session to dive into this and dive into what it would look like both at the national level, at the state level, and at the local level. So thanks for the time. Can, can you chime in a little bit? She also spoke about misconceptions around the vaccine. And I think Yolanda, there's a lot of misinformation and I don't wanna invalidate people that, I understand, it took me a while to wrap my head around this, I'm telling you, I, I, am, I have a big mouth. I don't give a fuck who you are. I will take you down. And even within the union leadership, there were chapter chairs who were biologists and chemists who refused to vaccinate. And at first I was like, what the fuck? Fucking Trump supporters. I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking, right? No, no, that wasn't the case. I think there's a lot of fear because we don't have community uh, outreach, because of being misinformed by Trump, by leaders who are telling you, oh, it's okay if you your kid doesn't wear a mask. It's fine. They're not going to get really sick. Let's try herd immunization. Fuck you. Where are your kids going to school? How many masks are your fucking kids wearing, right? But Howard, can you speak to, to okay, let's just put it practically. My son is 11. My daughter is six. Is it going to be okay for me to get them vaccinated when the vaccine comes out? Absolutely, it's going to be okay. Um, and so there was a major New York Times article written two days ago. It was, the, you know, of all the articles I've written, I, I mean, read, I spent about four or five hours a day reading both scientific and, and lay press articles. Uh, it may have been like the most outlandish one I've seen to date in almost two years. It basically questioned, why are we going to vaccinate five to 11 year olds? It said, maybe we shouldn't do that because the pandemic is over. And this is the direction um, that the li liberal fascists, you know, led by people like Biden, Anthony Fauci, uh, Dr. Walensky, the head of the CDC, are going. Basically, it's the idea that as long as the primarily white middle class and above are fully vaccinated, they can stay home to work, uh, maybe keep their hit kids home, the, the, it's over. You know, the economy's got to reopen. So in terms of the vaccine itself, um, this is the safest vaccine we've ever had. I think uh, what we know is that all previous vaccine used one or more animal components or other things that would actually increase people having allergic reactions, even anaphylactic reactions, which are extremely rare. This was done using mRNA. And I think that's really confusing to most people because that's why the people who are misinforming people said it's gonna change your DNA, whatever, because people don't know what the difference is between RNA and DNA and this whole process. So. What we have to realize is what's happened. In the last three months, we've had millions of kids who have gotten infected. 
we've had all 300 kids have died in the last three months. These are kids we're defining as everyone under 18. We have tens of thousands of those kids now have long COVID. Lots of them never knew they got sick because they were asymptomatic. Three quarters, two thirds of three quarters of all the kids who have died, all the kids who have multi system inflammatory syndrome, which is a horrible thing that's even worse than long COVID, by no coincidence are African American, Latino, and Native American, which has nothing to do with genetics. It has to do with racism and, in particular, structural racism. So the idea that we have kids, including my four-year-old granddaughter, right, who's basically um, <clears throat> indigenous Mexican, Afro-Cuban, you know, I'm half Egyptian and Moroccan, who's basically going to school with kids in Wisconsin where none of the teachers are wearing masks and most of the kids aren't wearing masks, um, what would you do? Of course, we need to vaccinate kids. We need to talk really honorably and listen to parents' real concerns about this vaccine and answer them. So I'm happy to work with anybody to develop a truly popular education presentation um, and listening session, because you know popular education is not mainly about presentation, <laughs> um, but to really do this so that we can spread the word about now when the vaccine is going to be approved in the next few days and it's going to be shipped, you know, on probably Monday or Tuesday. First and foremost, the CVS and Walgreens. Um, then basically. We, we need to get this on board. And the last thing I just wanna say about this is that we need to fundamentally develop a national program that combats what the Biden administration has put forward on every vaccine, but particularly the five to 11 year olds. They are honestly trying to make people believe that the primary place to go is your pediatrician um, or a clinic, including federally qualified health centers or a pharmacy. Those places are all short staffed, tremendously short staffed, and they're taking care of patients for lots of things, not primarily the pandemic. How could we expect to vaccinate 28 million children, which should be done as quickly as possible by using that method? That's, that's crazy. If you can get there, you know, Godspeed. But the main method is open the schools and do the vaccination there, like all of us over 50 on this on this video, on a Zoom call, got vaccinated. Yeah, every time I hear that, it makes me sick to my stomach. It infuriates me, you know? Sorry, it's just so fucking angry. Um, and he's right, I mean, yeah, I, I agree, I agree, totally. And I would love to have another session about, okay, I should, I'm sorry, sorry, Luke, sorry. I'll get them stacked real quick because I, I keep running my mouth, but we, we do have a, a session coming up on the 17th. And this, because I'm also in CPS Sick Out. Um, CPS Sick Out is a group of parents, and I guess I'm a leader now. Yay, me. But basically, they've been doing the Sick Outs in Chicago and inspiring other people, like people in New Jersey and other places, to pull their kids. For us, it's easy because our kids are home, but we do other actions, other, other educationals. Um, we've also aligned ourselves with global sick outs too, but we're going to do a listening session where we're going to invite parents and students to hear their concerns like Yolanda raised a concern that we really need to have instead of having the visceral reaction to have, which is like fucking Trump support. No, no, let's have a conversation with people and educate them about what the reality is behind the vaccine and, and why, um, you know, uh, all these things that we deserve to have and more, right? So I'll, I'll just post a bit.ly link. Um, and, and I know it's going to be hard because we in the left like to talk and I don't even really consider myself left, but I run my mouth a lot. But I think we have to practice our listening skills more. Uh, and, and it was a great proposal. And as soon as like, holy shit, that's a really good idea. Uh, trying to draw in more parents and more students. So, so um, it's not just Antonio <laughs> representing all the CPS kids. You know? <laughs> all right, I'll be quiet. I'll post that link. Anybody else have uh, questions? Joyce is on stack. Yeah, and I also see Howard's hand still up. But um, yeah, I I guess I, I think this is a really good idea to have as many of what, what, what it sounds like you're doing, these listening sessions and so forth connected to 
to whatever action people are taking. And I guess, you know, part of the thing that's so frustrating here is that they don't want a public education system to exist anymore either. I mean, you know, just like, you know, Howard was saying that it's, it's it, or somebody was saying, you know, there's a great advantage in a certain sense, they're, we're, they're killing off people who are some of the most needy of healthcare services in this country. And, you know, I know it sounds crazy that people would think this, but there really is a eugenic thought going on. I know we saw it when, you know, we were having discussions over the, um, you know, whether we should just let you know, let everybody go and, and, you know, the misunderstanding about what herd immunity is and all of that stuff that, that took its little face there. But I think, you know, from the, what I see in the school systems, that not only do they not want to build a public health system, and we're going to have to force that, they're, they're destroying the public education system and public, and, 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 what we don't want is to come out of this with more destruction than we have. And I think, you know, you were saying this, Hesu. I mean, look, some of us may have had experience with keeping kids home from school and doing the education ourselves, but we know that's not an answer for the majority of folk that work for a living and may not have had a good education themselves and they want the best for their kids. Never mind the mental health aspects that everybody's pointing out. You know, the, the, this is a, a mental health emergency as well. So maybe one of, I mean, maybe what you're saying too, Hisu, is, you know, it's a listening session and a talking. I mean, th th what everybody's talking about, how do we, how do we mobilize and build a system that includes high school kids, that includes, you know, your son, um, that includes people who are capable of being, and you know, most people are capable, right, in some way of, of doing this education. Because I think part of the thing is we really want to come out of this making sure we have a public health system and an education system. And um, and that that we demand you know, a government that that does that and that we're going to make that happen. I mean, we're not depending upon the Biden administration or anybody to to build that kind of government uh, structure, but we're going to have to confront, you know, what we need to confront along the way. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, maybe adding just that we're going to need to not only listen to people's ideas, but to their need for just feeling unsafe and feeling that the world is falling apart, you know, irrespective of COVID, but COVID, as we're all pointing out, has made that even more unstable. Um, and it's a, it's a big job. I mean, that's what we're all recognizing and we're gonna have to do the politics totally, you know, the, the question of the fight for power over our lives has gotta be tightly connected to the fight of using the skills that we all have to, to do the education we can do. But I, I totally support what you guys are thinking about. And we'll help what I can, how I can, yeah. yeah thank you, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. We're coming on to uh, a little after 2.45, so we're getting close to the end of our, our program. I'm looking for maybe some parting shots before we call on Hesu to do a poem and then Alan to close us out. So. <clears throat> Steve, Steve, Steve has his hand up. Steve, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to point out a hidden epidemic within this epidemic. And that is that uh, kids are now being forced more and more online, even if they go back, they're online, way more than they were before COVID. Uh, and of course, we know that too much screen time is not good, uh, but the whole concept of um, the online thing is this outmoded and totally repudiated concept of outcome-based education 
In other words, students work alone to achieve little teeny weeny successes that are measured by artificial uh, uh, intelligence and algorithms. The thing is that all this data is collected. And first of all, our kids are training their AIs so that they can market them better to the school districts. That's unpaid labor. You know, that's like making kids in the 18th century make sweaters for companies and things like this. Um, but uh, you have all of these things that are uh, going and they're just absolutely seizing uh, the data. So they create student profiles, uh, which they then market. They um, sell personalized education products, which they market to school districts and to students. And um, in general, they're just privatizing this data at a massive rate. Uh, this is, uh, you know, there's lots of aspects of what's going on, but it's clear that the only way you can deal with the privatizing is to demand the publicizing of it and make it public what's going on. Uh, you know, uh, in school boards are vulnerable to this charge because they all co collaborate with it. They're really selling the children to uh, the, these private corporations uh, to just harvest them. Uh, and it gets to the point that on the bar exam, for example, which was just done, taken recently, you had to log in eight times, except that uh, if you had a darker skin, it didn't recognize you, it kept telling you, it wouldn't let you log in. You had to change your lighting. So the guy changes his lighting, but he's Arab and sorry, you got to change your lighting. Uh, and this, I mean, this kind of catastrophe is what's going on. It's a real disintegration of the public and we've got to fight for the public in this. Howard, did you have a final comment you wanted to make? Sorry, I, I, I wanted to, um, I know there's a few people here. Oh, yeah, there's a few people here from California. So I just wanted to sort of uh, connect some dots that they're aware of and we're all aware of. Um, on the eve of another failed uh, COP, that's Conference of Parties. It's gonna start at Glasgow um, in two days. So um, I've lived in California and worked there for about 10 years, um, both in Los Angeles, in the Central Valley in Northern California, um, actually originally as a farm worker in the 60s and then uh, as a physician and doing other things. So here's the dots, and this is not just a California issue. Um, number one is access to potable water, to, to water that we can drink safely. Um, Hezu, myself, Lou, other people are sitting in the largest city in the world that's next to the largest body of fresh water. 22% of all the fresh water in the world are the Great Lakes. And Chicago is still a little bit ahead of Toronto in terms of the population of the largest city. For the first time in my life, I'm 74 and a half years old, uh, the city of Chicago issued a boil water order mm -hmm. uh, in May 16th of 2021. Mm -hmm. Why did it issue a, a boil order water? Um, the reason it did is because our grid all over the United States, uh, with the exception of a few large cities like Los Angeles, depends on a privatized for-profit capitalist company. Mm -hmm. And in our case, it's the largest one uh, in the United States called Commonwealth Edison uh, that's part of a larger uh, utility. And Commonwealth Edison is horrible of keeping up the infrastructure, particularly in black, black and brown neighborhoods. So they didn't keep up the transformer infrastructure and the backup generator in the water purification plant failed. So this, by no coincidence, um, is in the largest concentration of African-Americans in any urban area in the United States, mm. any urban area in the United States, a lot of whom are middle, upper middle class African-Americans uh, in a place called Morgan Park. Uh, why is that important? Well, it's important because all over this country, particularly uh, to my sisters and brothers who I still relate to uh, in the Central Valley of California, basically there's no water. There's literally no water, but this is not just an issue for places like the Central Valley of California. Uh, what's gonna happen if in two months uh, or less, uh, we have a polar vortex in the Midwest like we did two years ago, when we got down to 1.4%, that's 1.4% of all the natural gas reserves. That means in the Midwest, if we run out of natural gas, there's no heat 
for about 80% of the people, including everyone in Chicago, Detroit, and other places. Uh, what's going to happen uh, when the grid goes out at that point? Because everybody's plugging in a portable electric heater. Um, and then there's no water because the water purification plants don't do this. And I'll just end by, by explaining uh, probably the most important climate change study I've, I've seen in, in 55 years of working on climate change came out in May in a peer reviewed journal. And that basically hypothesized what's going to happen. Uh, and I'm glad that our sister Rita is in Atlanta. What's going to happen if there is a major heat wave, which of course is going to be coming more and more frequently, and, and the electricity goes out, not just locally, but in the regional or national grid. And so they hypothesized this for Atlanta, Detroit, and Phoenix. Um, in Atlanta, 89% um, of the people got heat stroke within uh, 48 hours. In Detroit, it took 72 hours. In Phoenix, it took 20 hours. Um, so we're facing this um, and we're facing it because we know that COVID type pandemics are gonna be coming more and more frequently. And so the need to do this is based exactly what the Panthers and the Rainbow Coalition did in the 60s all over this country. And that is, this is community survival and worker survival pending revolution. Uh, that's the only way to look at this. And that's why we need to build this united front now. And I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Howard. Thanks. Um, it's scary. Hey Sue, would you like to? Actually, Rita, were you on stack? Because I, I can. The poem isn't that long. We got five minutes. Okay. Well. Uh, okay. All right. I'll, I'll All right. just say a couple of things. I mean, I think Howard and and you know really raised an important issue that it's not only breaking down the silos like Hezu was saying in the beginning about you know the silos between trade unions, the silos between trade unions and the social movement, all of those. It's also the silos of the broader struggle, right? I mean, and when we, because I think what we're really talking about is building a class that's capable of defending itself and going on the offensive. And so that requires a consciousness. And, you know, that, that consciousness, I think one of the key components of that consciousness is, under, you know, is getting a deeper understanding of the relationship between white supremacy and capitalism. Um, Joyce mentioned uh, when she was talking eugenics, and this is something I often work on with some, some folks here, but you know, one of the things we haven't mentioned, and that has is certainly true, is the school to prison pipeline. And by definition, prisons are not safe, uh, and you cannot isolate, you cannot mitigate, you can't quarantine in prisons. And so, you know, particularly again, you know, from the southern experience, where there may not be any jobs or very few jobs, particularly in the rural areas of of Georgia, there certainly are jobs in terms of prisons and jails. Um, and we recently just you know, had a, 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 a large whistleblowing incident where eugenics is alive and well. Uh, detained immigrant women were involuntarily sterilized at the Irwin County Detention Center. As long as the class doesn't see this as part of their battle, as part of a, a broader battle, as part of a class battle, as long as we don't, recognize what goes on at the border goes on in in my home too as long as we think that some kind of way uh either biologically well certainly biologically that there is any kind of biological differences between us which there are not racism race is not biological it is a political construct whose main role is to keep us from developing the kind of class strength that we, or one of the main roles, uh, to keep us from developing the class strength that we need. So, um, you know, I just, I just say that in this process of trying to build unity, in this process of trying to cross, make this, this crossover between the silos and the way that we work. Um, this question of looking at our, particularly our healthcare institutions and 
and schools, you know, dismantling white supremacy is, I think, an integral part of the struggle to bring an end to private ownership of the things that we actually need in society to, to achieve human happiness, um, human cooperation, human safety, human security. Um, that, that I, I just wanted to share that with you because I think you know the other comrades had had raised some of that uh, that up climate, mass incarceration, public education, no 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 universal, comprehensive, equitable, um, affordable community based health care of any kind. All of these things are connected. And, and just thanks again. Thanks again. Thank God, Rita. That what a beautiful way to end. Sorry, I keep stealing your job, Lou. Sorry, I'm just so excited to be here. So I'm gonna close out with a poem. I, I put the link in, it, it feels unfinished to me and maybe part of the reason it feels like it's unfinished is because we're still in this process. Um, but it's, uh, I dedicated to my um, poet friend, uh, Jay Mehta, who died two years ago. I'm gonna start crying because his wife also got cancer. And it seems like she has also died and it's just so fucking tragic. Um, but a uh, uh, beautiful soul, but I, I dedicated it to, to our children. And I think it, it fits, it fits a moment now. So if I'm a little low energy too, I'm, I'm under the weather. I've been sick with a head cold, but this call, it's called um, our children's feet like stars. Our children's feet like stars will guide us down infinite paths of love beyond the scope of CPS purification, beyond the light of stealing COVID funds, beyond the commercial din of consumption, beyond this disease ravishing young kids. Vaccines for profit, politicians for profit, CPS for profit, our children consume for profit a disease born of an even older disease, but our children born of us will march towards a better world, setting hard hearts free, dancing towards new planets, freeing mouths from cannibalizing, freeing mouths from lying, like Dr. Quack Quack, liberating, liberating, liberating our children, traversing down these roads, alight with angelic discourse towards a world within our reach. Our children will guide us down infinite paths of love, teaching us to be humans once more, teaching us what matters to live and to truly die for. And we, we will walk side by side into the possible. That was it. Our children's feet Thank like you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, my pleasure. Alan, would you be so kind as to uh, <clears throat> close us out? Yes, just a moment. The LRNA wishes to thank the panelists, other participants, and the audience for sharing in today's event on Zoom. <clears throat> this gathering is the latest such event the League has been hosting for more than a year. Links to previous events can be found simply by going to lrna.org and clicking on the events calendar tab. <clears throat> the year 2022 will be a watershed in the battle to demand a government that stops serving corporate profit and starts providing for human needs, reproductive freedom, ending state violence, and saving the earth. Be sure to register for and join Fighting for Our Future a National Dialogue for Revolutionaries on Saturday, November 20 at 11 a.m. in the Pacific Time Zone, the same as 1 p.m. Central and 2 p.m. Eastern. <clears throat> what is the LRNA? The League of Revolutionaries for a New America brings together people from diverse backgrounds and experiences. The League is dedicated to the important work of meeting and joining with other revolutionaries engaged in fighting for the basic needs of the class and obtaining class power needed to transform this system. The LRNA's form of direct action is analysis and education. It is dedicated to study and learning 
as well as helping to elevate the consciousness of other revolutionaries in areas of struggle, such as the workplace, the classroom, various organizations, and the street. It works to raise and politicize issues of private property and of the need for class power. The League's role as revolutionaries is to connect with the thinking of people, to help bring clarity, and to develop consciousness. Through their motion and inquiry, it helps lead revolutionaries from perceiving a problem in the objective world to understanding its cause and envisioning its solution. The voice of the League is the Rally Comrades newspaper, which is accessible at lrna.org and also at rallycomrades.lrna.org. The League encourages you to visit the Rally sites, read, share, and subscribe. Contact the League of Revolutionaries for a New America via email at info at lrna.org for general information, events at lrna.org for information about League events, and you can contact Rally Comrades at rally at lrna.org. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Alan. Um, we're, uh, we're now closing our program and uh, we'll be, I'm sure, doing more of this again. We appreciate everybody who's been here. Thank you so much. What kind of world do we want? Our history has just begun. Sad are you on the country fool? Sad are you on the country side? Sad are you on the country Woo! <laughs>